So this is the second paper, a very interesting one, very relevant, uh, how you can construct a DSG model where uh, information is, uh, is a state variable and where you can test whether that makes the economy subject not to increasing or decreasing returns. So very, very interesting. Um, Mariam Farboudi is, uh, is the author uh, and presenter here. So please, uh, Mariam, uh, I invite you to the pod podium and um, you have 30 minutes, as you know. And uh, the discussion is, as, uh, is uh, Edouard Schall. Uh, we will uh, follow with, with 15 minutes. Great. Thanks so much for uh, having me. And this is joint work with Laura Weltkamp, who's at Columbia. So I want to talk about a model of the data economy. <laughs> and I kind of want to start by reiterating what Jean talked about yesterday, which is there are things in the economy that is changing. And the same way that the policy that was used to regulate large, like two-sided platforms did not, does not work clearly for different reasons. It's unclear whether the ways that we used to think about different parts of the economy, like the production economy so far, are exactly relevant for the similar tech giants or the data economy still. The point is that if you think about it in the very large scheme of things, the largest firms are very heavily valued for their data. And that raises the question whether and in what frequency or horizon uh, the common ways that we used to think about capital is relevant for data as in just an alternative asset and where we should change our thinking. And I want to start by saying that this is kind of challenging because one, um, data, and that is that lies at the core of the paper, that data is a byproduct of economic transactions, okay? And it's difficult to measure, okay? Um, we don't have, we still, as a, as a profession, have not, I think, settled on a way to say, okay, this is how we measure data, okay? So that makes life hard. And you can think about this as production is a form of active experimentation for firms because that produces them with data that we usually think about. We used to think about it as a different thing. You experiment, you go and produce, now you produce to exper and experiment at the same time. The second thing which, I mean this is not, data is not the only non-rival or non-exclusive good, but it is one and it's very, very important, okay? However, I, wanna, I want you to, as I go on, think about this as like a semi-rival good. So data value falls as more people have it, okay? It can be because of competitive forces, it can be because of a different source of regulation that does not allow a data seller to fully use it, and so on and so forth. Then the other thing which is important about data valuation is that um, data is the um, same piece of data that you produce. You can use it for multiple periods, not forever. So in that sense, it, it is, there is some similarities to capital in that you have to depreciate it. But how do we depreciate the same piece of data that we cannot very really well measure? Okay. <laughs> And uh, the other thing related to this depreciation is that data depreciation rate depends on a lot of economic conditions. But, and both of these facts, and the fact that data is a long-lived asset basically gives rise to the point that you raised that we need like a dynamic programming framework to be able to think about data. A static methodology probably does not work well. So here, what we really want to do is we just want to provide a, a theoretical framework to think about these key economic forces, okay? So I'm not gonna show anything rocket science here, okay? Everything that I show, you've seen somewhere in some context, but we are, what we are hoping that the framework that we put forward is simple enough, and you can see like 500 million simplifying assumptions that I'm gonna make, 
okay? It captures the main forces about data and it allows us to think about important things that are also very important for regulation, in particular data markets, okay? Although I'm not gonna have time to talk about it here because I've gotta focus on long run and short run uh, properties of the economy, on policy and on measurement, okay? And kind of the, what I think is quite interesting is that this model, as simple as it is, it has uh, very realistic predictions that we see in everyday life around us. So the model is um, a recursive framework and it is really as tractable as a standard GSG model. Of course, if you wanna go do measurement, you should not use this model because it's too simplified. But it's very, e like the, um, the uh, uh, other DSE frameworks, uh, we are hoping that uh, you can add as many complications as you wish to it and then go and uh, numerically um, measure it. So it allows us uh, to value the data and data intensive firms, okay. Uh, it uh, values uh, data that is, at, that is transacted at zero price as well as like relevant digital services, uh, kind of things I want you to have in mind, things that John talked about yesterday. And also, hopefully it can inform us about GDP measurements. So part of the GDP measurement that is missing because we don't measure data. All right, so let me jump into the model. And um, I'm gonna kind of go fast on some pieces, but it's, anyways. So there's gonna be, so, I wanna be again upfront. I'm gonna try, in this paper, we're gonna try to focus on what is data good for, okay? We know a lot about what is data bad for, so we're gonna, I'm gonna focus on about uh, what is data good for. In particular, I'm gonna shut down any competition, okay? So, not that we think there's no competition, but let's shut it down. So, there's a, comp a continuum of competitive firms. Each firm uses capital, uh, capital firm I at time T is KIT to produce with the uh, uh, concave technology, KIT to the alpha. And every good has a quality, okay. And the quality, I'm gonna call it AIT. Think you can think about it as a productivity, but let's call it quality. Now, uh, I need to talk about the output and the, um, and the demand curve. So. First simplifying assumption, output, it, all goods, quality adjusted are perfect substitutes. This is not true, okay? But this makes my life a lot easier, okay? And you can use Dixit cyclic preferences to change it, okay? Then I'm gonna, we're gonna assume a downward sloping demand curve, okay? So, um, and then at the end, hopefully I'm gonna have time when I wanna talk about efficiency to give you a micro foundation of it. But for now, take it as given. So you can see there is no notion of data here. So I have to introduce data to you. So what's important about data, I wanna, like going into this talk, I want you to think about data. And when you think about data, think of three things. One, data is a byproduct of economic activity. Two, data is semi-rival. And three, data is used for prediction. Not all the data in the world is used for prediction. So patents are, can be thought about a form of data. Not all patents are about prediction. There are patents that talk about, that are about prediction, and there we have to say, something to say about them, but not all the patents and patents are data. So this paper is not about all the type of data in the world, it's about data that is used for prediction. Why? Because a lot of technologies that are de being developed now, AI and ML technologies that are uh, tools for prediction. So that is a large part of the ongoing debate. Okay, so um, because data is used for prediction, it is used to improve forecasts. So I have to introduce forecasts into my models and quality is where forecasts come in. So good quality of each firm depends on the forecasts. How do we think about this? Um, Imagine that each firm has an optimal technique to produce with, okay? You can think about this as customer taste, like whether we write like, next year we would like running shoes, we would like blue shirts. 
You can think about Uber, where, where am I gonna sell, send the cars? Okay, so that's the, also the optimal technique. You can think about like what technologies has to be incorporated into self-driving cars. Okay, so all of these are different optimal techniques. The optimal technique has two parts. One part is predictable, that's theta t. The second part is not predictable, it's completely IID. The predictable part is AR1 and has an innovation. Okay. Um, and the, uh, on the unpredictable part is unlearnable. That's what I mean by unpredictable. Then what about the quality? The quality depends on the chosen production technique by the firm and how much it is different from the optimal technique. So if people are gonna like blue shirts, the closer you produce the blue shirts, okay, your quality is better, okay. Uh, so, and so you can see that A, which is the quality, is a G function of the square difference of the optimal, of the chosen production technique and the optimal technique. Square difference for all the uh, uh, information people expect that square is variance, so that's beautiful. Okay, what's important is that G is monotonically decreasing. What does that mean? That means accuracy is good. You want your production technique to be as close as optimal technique. Okay, all right. Now, this is what work forecasts uh, are used for. Now, where does data go? Data is information that is used for forecasting. Okay, and now you can see the fact that I said data is a byproduct of production. Okay, so a firm that produces KIT to the alpha, produces NIT data points. Okay, these data points are about the future optimal technique. And um, data is basically a byproduct of the amount of production times the technology that you have for data mining, how much data you can extract from the same amount of uh, production or transactions. You can think about Walmart as a company which has like terrible ZI, okay, versus Amazon as a company that has great ZI, okay. So firms can be different in how good they are in the technology to extract data. Of course, thinking about the evolution of Z and how Z is determined is very important. That's outside the scope of the paper. I'm gonna take it as given. Now, each data point is just a normal signal about the realization of the future optimal technique. All right, so this already gives you something that we've all heard about very often, which is the data feedback loop. If a firm has more transactions, it has more data, it has higher quality or efficiency, then it has more uh, customers and more transactions, and this goes on and on and and the whole thing would, should explode, okay? I wanna argue for you that this Although the state of feedback loop is in action in part of the time, during part in when firm is young in the short run if you want, it's not the dominant force in the long run. In the long run there is another force, at least for data that is used for prediction, that kicks in and is stronger than this force, okay? So, before going to there, let me talk about one last piece that is important to think about data, so, so far, most of the things that I said, you're like, okay, this is learning by doing, okay? And this is where data is very different from learning by doing, that is data is tradable, okay? And that's an important key part of the paper is the market for data, okay? Um, uh, so let's, delta IT, you know, the amount of data that is traded by firm I at time T, for simple, and then delta IT is positive, uh, it, if from I is purchasing data and it's negative if it's selling data. For simplicity, let's assume that firm can buy or sell but not both. It, that's not that relevant. Okay, I, I won't have time to tell you what changes, but like anyways. Then also in the spirit of saying that thinking about um, good things about the data, assume that there is a competitive market for data trade that clears at the price pi. Okay. Now, as I said, the other important feature of the data is that data is multi-use. What does that mean? That means data is non-rival, or some, I wanna call it semi-rival, because firm can sell the data and still use some of it, okay? 
So let me introduce this uh, parameters iota, which is the fraction of sold data that is lost to the seller. If iota is one, that means data is perfectly rival. Think about capital, okay? You, either I have it or you have it. If iota is zero, that means data is perfectly rival. Uh, we, for uh, technical reasons, we cannot handle iota zero, but you can uh, go as much as you want to um, uh, close to zero. And it's not such a bad assumption because many uh, uh, data contracts include like prohibitions on seller use of data as well as it just can simply stand for competitive forces that the value of data falls. Now, because it's a dynamic model, I just don't want uh, things to uh, converge uh, uh, instantaneously. I need an adjustment cost for the data, all right? Okay, now let me very quickly tell you what I'm gonna show you. One, I'm gonna show you that, well, data is an asset because it's long-lived, how we should depreciate it and value it. Then I wanna argue that in the long run, there's a second force that, lead, that dominates a data feedback loop and that, leads, that is diminishing return. And that means that in the long run, there cannot be any uh, in this model, there cannot be any growth without innovation. And innovation, I'm gonna talk about innovation too, and innovation um, can be done purely by data that is used by, for prediction, and that's um, the, the formulation that I'm gonna use, which leads to endogenous gro uh, growth, looks like a data ladder, okay? Uh, but when there's the reason for diminishing return is very simple. As you, as you saw, data is to reduce variance in this model, okay? And variance is a concave function, okay? The first unit of data that you have tells you a lot about how you should move your actions, adjust your optimal actions, okay? But once you have like 500 million points of data, the 500 million plus one point of data doesn't uh, yeah, help you that much, and that means that in the very long run, when there's a lot of data, uh, decreasing return to scale kicks in. But in the short run, there is increasing returns, and in fact, we show that every firm in this economy needs to make initial negative profits. That can lead to, po and, and they, because they buy data on the open market, that can lead to data poverty traps for the firms. We can also, and uh, talk about two things that we see every day around us, data borders, the apps that you all have on your phones, which are given to you for free, because the firm wants to basically exchange the good that it's uh, giving you with the data that it can get from you to improve its own quality going forward. And then um, we can talk about book to market uh, dynamics. And at the very end, I'm gonna quickly talk about welfare in this, um, model and how you can very simply introduce like business ceiling externalities. All right, so the first, let me talk very quickly about Bayes' law uh, and how to how use that to think about data depreciation as an asset. Um, remember the goal is to forecast the optimal production technique tomorrow, okay? And uh, the priors about the optimal production technique today has a mean and a variance. And the inver think about the inverse of the variance, which is the precision as the stock of knowledge of a firm, okay? This is how much the firm knows. And then you can see that how, why I built in all this beautiful linearity, because Bayes' law says that for normal variables, posterior precision is additive. It's prior precision plus all the signals that you receive from the data that you have, okay? So the posterior precision of a firm about, the, uh, about its optimal technique is its prior precision plus the precision that it gets from all the signals that we are gonna talk about. And that tells you how you, when you have to discount his previous uh, stock of knowledge more. When the persistence of the optimal technique is lower, then the previous data is not that useful. Also, when the economic environment is very volatile, so there is a lot of noise to the optimal technique, maybe because new technologies are arriving, okay? Then also, you need to discount the previous knowledge more, okay? Um, and now, that gives me all the grounds to think about valuing data 
As I said, the optimal technique that the firm has to produce with is the expectation that it has with all of the data that it has and all of the precision that it has about its optimal technique. So the quality is basically a function of the squared forecast errors that gives me my state, my single state variable to think about, to put in a DSG model, which is the stock of knowledge. It's the inverse variance of how, of the belief of the firm about its optimal production technique, okay? And that makes me, makes my life very easy. I can reduce this huge model into um, a value function of the firm and the only state variable is the uh, stock of knowledge of the firm, okay? Now the firm chooses a time t, its capital, and um, data traded to maximize the sum of a bunch of terms, the amount of profits that it makes on the goods market, and the quality of the goods is determined by how much stock of knowledge it has to produce better goods. The firm is price taker, so. Then the firm has to rent the capital, the firm has to pay the adjustment cost. Importantly, the firm can trade. Okay, so you can see that when firms choose a capital, it produces a bunch of uh, data, okay? It can use the data and add it to whatever, um, to the signal that he has, okay? Or it, it can sell it on the data market and makes profits. So you can see that data is, has two different uses. One is that the firm can use it itself or it can sell it on the data market. And this is really an important force to think about regulating data market among firms. So another point which I think is important is that a lot of regulation efforts has gone into regulating the data market between customers and the firms. This is a different data market. This is the data market across, if you want, firms, different firms, or firms and platforms which are firms, okay? And there is less work in regulating or thinking about those markets. Um, so but let me say one last point about this notion of semi-rivalry and data markets, and that gives rise to this very strange uh, property of the data market. So think about what is the benefit to buying one unit of data? You get the marginal benefit of increasing your stock of knowledge, minus you have to pay for it. What about the cost of selling one unit of data? The cost, you only lose a euro fraction of it. You don't lose all of it, but you gain the whole price, okay? So you can see that this is negative bid-ask spread. Negative bid ask spread is something that we are not used to, and it's a what does it do? It gives, it, it puts a, comp um, it gives firms to, an incentive to participate in the data market, okay? Because they lose less than buying the data, okay? And um, so that means, and that is the part that has to go into thinking about how to design this policy. In fact, in this model, you can see, well, I, at the very end, I'm gonna show you a very simple case where firms oversell data, okay? So you have to like stop selling a little bit, okay? So now, in terms of the long-run growth, the long-run growth in the, with the quality function that I showed you is very simple in that the data inflow is concave, because of the force that I told you about the long run, while the data outflow is, the depreciation is almost linear, this is not exactly linear, okay? So, and in this case, the growth would stop. Now, how, you can say that, okay, this really depends, it's very specific to the, all the assumptions that you make, and there is some specificity, and here is the specificity. You need two things at the same time for the growth to stop. One thing is that, uh, for, for the growth not to stop, sorry. One thing is that, well, infinite quality should be, able, should be uh, possible to reach when you have a lot of data, okay? So that's kind of a little bit like obvious you would need that for, uh, for uh, permanent growth. The second thing is that you cannot have any fundamental randomness. 
so that you can achieve perfect quality if you can uh, do uh, if you um, if you can perfectly hit the optimal technique okay but you can only hit the optimal technique with all the data in the world if there is no fundamental randomness you have to be able to learn everything so to the extent that we think there is fundamental randomness like covid uh, with this type of uh, quality, um, uh, permanent growth is not possible. However, you can have endogenous growth. As I said, think about a ladder quality. The quality today is the quality yesterday plus uh, the quality of a new technology. I call it Delta Hat AIT. If the firm chooses to incorporate it. That's the max, okay. Now, the quality of this new technology depends, that's what depends on the data. That is, again, this is similar to the G that I used to have. This is uh, decreasing in, um, in the error, okay. So data that is used for prediction improves the forecast, decreases the quadratic error, or if you want, decreases the risk. You can think about decreases the variance or decreases the risk. Think about self-driving cars. The technology is about decreasing the risk of an accident. If the risk of an accident is very high, the profitability, uh, of the, the um, efficiency of this new self-driving car technology is negative, you're not gonna incorporate it. But once the prediction is good enough, then it's good and we incorporate it. And that can change the, the frontier of technology. This is still a purely predictive technology, but it can lead to endogenous growth. So in that sense, in the long run, data does look like capital. Depends on what data in its purely predictive role looks like, a, like capital. In the short run, things are different. In particular, there are parameters that when knowledge is scarce, so the stock of knowledge of the firm is small, then the data, net data inflow is actually convex. So it increases over time. You can see to the left of the graph, and that's the red line. So you can see that there is a, a solid lead line, that's the total data of the firm. The dashed lead line is the data that comes from firm's production, and the gray area is what the firm buys on the data market. Okay, and this, in the beginning, you can see the firm has to either produce data or buy on the data market, and that leads to losses, okay. The firm, in the very early life, early part of the life of the firm, the firm doesn't have any data, so its quality is low. If it wants to produce, it has to rent capital, make losses to get data, or it has to go buy data on the data market to improve its quality. So in the early phases, there are profit losses, but there are an investment in data by buying data from the data market, from other firms, or getting data from production. So, and that rings a bell, like Amazon has been making, um, Amazon has been making losses for too long, but anyways, so that is something that we have been seeing very often. And the thing is that by accounting rules, at least in the US, the book value only includes purchased data. Okay, and a lot of data of the firm is produced as a byproduct of its own economic transaction, and that leads to an undercounting of the book value. Okay, so that means a very large market to book. Then the other thing I wanna talk about is the data part barter, which is basically why do you wanna produce at a loss? And the reason is that effectively, when a firm is producing at a loss, it's exchanging uh, data for the good. At price of good of PT, it gives you the up so that it can attract your data and then produce a better quality good and then better quality app and then come up with subscriptions and get people pay for it. And that rises in the early life of the firm because the valuation of the firm um, is increasing in its stock of knowledge. And this also leads to a lot of missing uh, GDP value uh, because this digital economic activity is undercounted. 
So let me use my last one minute to very quickly say that you can all see that I've made everything in the model perfectly competitive, okay? Uh, so the market, the model the equilibrium is efficient, okay? Let me talk about the simplest way on earth to incorporate inefficiency in this model, which is, think about it like a lot of data is used for advertising. Maybe not all the advertising is actually quality enhancing, Okay, how can I think about it? A simple way to think about it is that data processing helps the firm that uses it, but hurts others. You can, um, there is uh, this uh, framework thing uh, introduced by Morris and Scheer, which, which is called business feeling, okay? So you can very simply incorporate it in the model. The quality of the firm is downward sloping in its own um, uh, forecast error but it's increasing in other forecast error. So this is very uh, similar to think the concept of keeping up with Joneses in consumption, okay? A firm's quality is high only if it is better than its, uh, than its other uh, uh, competitors or other firms in the market, okay? And basically, for, you can see that there's an integral, blah, blah, blah. So uh, firm's choices and firm dynamics and aggregate quality are unchanged. What is changed is welfare. In fact, in the data market, in this case, um, there is over uh, trade, because firms do not incorporate the fact that when they're selling data, they're hurting themselves. So thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Edouard, please. All right, let me first uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss the paper. This is a paper that's been around already for quite a while. I knew it already. I've seen it many times, but still there is a lot to, you know, a lot to say about the papers. I'm really glad to be given the opportunity to discuss it. So um, <clears throat> what does the paper do? So the paper first asks a very important question, which is how is big data uh, transforming our economy? And what the main objective of the paper then is going to provide a baseline framework that everybody can use to start you know, formalizing a little bit the debate. In doing so, they're going to choose a very particular approach, which is you know, to choose one particular way in which data can be used, and that way is going to be that data is used in forecasting. More precisely, it's going to be used to forecast demand. Firms are going to be to, trying to track consumer taste, and they're going to try to, you know, knowing that, pr propose uh, you know, services or goods that match this taste the best as they can. Okay? Now, the second key idea of the paper is that data is a byproduct of uh, economic uh, activity. Uh, so here, transactions generate data. Uh, and we're, as we're going to see, this is going to be uh, really the, the core of most of the predictions of the model uh, that are going to be uh, unusual. Uh, data is also a non-rival thing. Uh, and uh, as I'm going to show you, uh, you know, I'm going to discuss at least uh, in the data, there is a lot of trade uh, in data. Uh, and so that's also something that is uh, allowed in the paper. So the model that they propose is a very tractable model. It is basically a very standard uh, firm dynamic model with decreasing returns in the long run. Uh, so it looks a bit like a standard Hoppenheim type of, uh, of model, so something that we know very well, and therefore can be very easily introduced into a more standard DSG model. Uh, so the model is simple, but it's already able to generate a lot of uh, predictions. The main prediction is, I would say, on the short run. Uh, so the presence of this feedback from data, this idea that data generates, that economic activity generates data, is going to produce uh, uh, some feedback in the short run that's going to lead to increasing returns. Basically, firms are going to produce, are going to start, uh, you know, producing a uh, low amount. They're going to collect more, uh, more users, more customers, more data. That's going to allow them to increase their productivity. They'll, they'll collect even more data, et cetera. So initially, we're going to have this phase of increasing returns. Now, these increasing returns are not going to last forever because, you know, because this is data used in forecasting. At some point, as you accumulate a lot of information, you're basically going to know the truth. Uncertainty is going to be low. So a marginal increase in information is not going to increase your TFP forever. So in the long run, basically, we go back to a standard model of firm dynamics with decreasing returns. Uh, so that's really like one of the key features of the model that is then going to generate a lot of the, the rest of the predictions. 
So some of those predictions, for instance, is that the model can generate negative profits. That's not surprising because we have increasing returns. What is uh, more, more surprising here is that the model can explain the, the concept of data barter. So the idea that these firms can actually still exist even if the, the, the products or the services they're proposing has a zero price, just because firms are actually collecting data and selling it on the other market. So something that connects, uh, again, to Jean's discussion yesterday about two-sided markets. Uh, the, model, the, the paper also covers a bunch of discussion about uh, measurement, uh, because data, of course, is, a, is, is an abstract thing. It is hard also to measure. Uh, so there's a lot of mismeasurement, and you know, the paper goes over uh, you know, different issues about book, uh, book values, market values of firms. There is also the question of missing GDP. Because of data barter, we might be missing a lot of potential GDP. And then the paper turns to long-run issues. Uh, so it's going to talk about whether or not data can generate long-run growth. Uh, the answer here is that in the baseline model, it is not possible. And uh, this is because here mostly data in the baseline model has a level effect on TFP, not a growth effect. Uh, and it also turns to welfare. Uh, so here the model is really a, base, you know, really a simple benchmark, frictionless, perfect competition. Uh, there is no externality. Data is non-rival, but there is a market for it, so no externality. So the model is actually efficient, despite the fact that you have non-convexities. This is not something that uh, you know, uh, leads to a failure of the first welfare theorem. So the model is efficient. Of course, this is not necessarily something that we believe, uh, and the authors agree. So that's why then they turn to, uh, you know, they introduce some uh, relevant uh, externality, which is this business stealing externality. Okay. So that's a quick summary of what the paper does. And let me now turn to my uh, my comments. First of all. This is a thought-provoking paper. Uh, so this is an important paper because this is really, you know, maybe with Jones and Tonetti, one of the, you know, one of the few papers that really opened this new uh, research agenda on the data economy. So you know, this is, you know, a big picture paper. Uh, maybe we're going to see, uh, you know, we're going to discuss that, you know, maybe people in the audience might disagree about some forces that might be missing. But you know, this might be true, but this is not the point. This is a paper that is a big picture paper that tries to derive strong insights out of simple assumptions. And I think on that, the paper does a, a very nice job. The model is very nice and tractable. Uh, and you know, I think this is a great tool for other researchers to build upon. Huh? So as I was saying, the paper has been around for quite a while. I think a lot has been said already about the paper. Um, Whatever I'm going to say, I'm sure uh, you know, uh, Mariam and, and Laura have thought about it, and they have good reasons not to have included it. But anyway, let, just for the sake of the discussion, let me go uh, over some, uh, some of my comments. So I would say one, one thing that uh, is striking about the paper when you read it is that it, you know, for a phenomenon that is very empirical, that is all about data, uh, there's not much data in the paper. Right? So this is a very theory-driven uh, paper. And you know, this is totally fun. We should be uh, uh, allowed to write pure theory papers. But it's true that you know, in this paper, I think the, the tiny tension is that a lot of the predictions are very, very model dependent. And so uh, it would be nice, perhaps, to, to give some supporting evidence for you know, all these uh, modeling choices. Now, you know, I'm saying that, but of course, this is one of the first papers in the literature. You have to make choices. I think the choices that Mariam and Laura have made are very natural, especially coming from uh, people that work on information. Um, but let me give you a few examples of the things that, of course, we were led to question. One is, for, for instance, so why is data something that affects mostly the level of TFP and not the growth of TFP? Uh, so Mariam talked a little bit about that, but you know, the, the long-run uh, implications, whether or not you can generate growth, are absolutely linked to this. Uh, people in the literature, Jones and Tonetti, have likened, likened data to ideas. So therefore, ideas is something maybe that could be an input to R&D innovation. So naturally, uh, we, we, we can question that. Another one is uh, the fact that the paper uh, puts a lot of emphasis on this uh, feedback from information and this idea that transactions generate information. So I think it's a very interesting idea. Is it true in practice? Is the data that firms collect really something that scales up with uh, their activity? I'm going to try to show you some pictures uh, later. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, this is not always the case, so we may be led to question that you know, maybe this feedback might be weaker uh, in practice. Another one uh, is also uh, the strength of the diminishing returns here. So here, naturally, we think that there are diminishing returns in the long run because data is something that, you know, as, as I was saying, in the long run, you know everything, so data does not really reduce uncertainty anymore. Well, that actually depends a lot on functional form assumptions as well. So here, the authors are choosing a Gaussian model of learning. Of course, this is great. This is super tractable. 
variable, you have one state variable. But if we were using a fat tail model, and if the information you were getting were about where the lower threshold is, actually the variance may not decrease. And you might still ha actually have uh, endogenous growth through a different channel in this model. Huh? So you know, I'm not saying that I dislike uh, any of those choices, but just, just that the predictions depend on them. And ultimately, what we want to do is that these choices might, you know, should be guided uh, by empirics. Now, so I'm going to discuss a little bit the empirics then. I'm going to try to do that uh, in practice. So it would be nice to know, you know, who, which firms use big data, which sectors, from what sources, what is the kind of data that they collect, and also how they use this data. Okay, so I'm going to try to, to, to go a little bit over that. Now, I was surprised to discover that despite this being a, a, you know, a very important phenomenon that is all about data and firms having too much data, it seems that they do not, these firms do not share this data with us. Uh, most surveys are still actually quite vague and quite loose. So you know, I'm just going to show you what we have. One, uh, what I'm going to show you actually is from one of our students at UPS. So one of the great uh, you know, uh, impacts of the paper is that it has triggered a lot of new research. And our students are working on Mariam's paper. So uh, my student, uh, Alejandro Rabano Suarez, has kindly allowed me to show, uh, to show you some of his pictures. So let's go over that. So the sources are going to come from two surveys, uh, one from France, the other one from, from the US. And you know, so these are surveys that are going to try to you know, cover a broad enough uh, spectrum of firms trying to ask about their use of big data. Big data, of course, is something we need to define. It's a, it's a loose concept. The way it is done in most of these surveys is the following. So big data, we're usually going to think about the use of massive data sets. And that you are usually going to have a huge volume of data, a huge flow with continuous updating of this data and also complex structure. Uh, all these things that make it hard to use standard tools to analyze the data and require specific technique. Yeah? So that's kind of the broad idea, uh, you know, what we're going to define as, as big data. I'm not sure you can see very well, but so this is, uh, this is data from France, okay, so that tries to cover, uh, you know, across different sectors, the adoption of big data and also the sources of big data. And what's interesting is to see that actually, the, the, you know, in France at least, the main sector that uses big data is transport. And the source of the data that they use is actually geolocalization. So think about Uber really uh, using uh, geolocalization for its customers and also its drivers. But also think about delivery firms that are actually try, you know, uh, tracking their drivers to optimize the delivery process. Already there, we can be led to question whether or not this is you know, the, the amount of information necessarily scales up with the number of customers. Uh, if it's just about uh, tracking your own drivers, that's not necessarily the same. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, sector uh, is information and communication, not too surprising. What's interesting is that for them, then the main source of information is going to be social networks. Uh, so the main, the main things to take away from this, uh, from this kind of picture is the following, that big data is clearly something that you know, is big, 25% of adoption in the transport sector. But it's also a very varied uh, thing. Uh, different sectors you know, may or may not use big data, and they, they may also use very different uh, kinds of data. Uh, this is another figure uh, that goes along the lines of uh, Mariam and Laura's paper. This is about the use of big data as a function of firm size. And it seems to be that, indeed, uh, small firms do not use big data. Large firms do. Uh, so that's uh, you know, something that seems to be in line with the predictions of the model. Also something that could be in line with the use of fixed costs. Perhaps sending up uh, big data uh, department in a firm also requires huge setup costs, lots of storage facilities, and the right skills to study that. Uh. Finally, about the, the use of big data. So it turns out that it's, uh, you know, it's been very hard uh, to find also uh, good evidence on how exactly is this data used by firms. So this data here is from the US. This is not about big data. This is about the use of AI, which is still somewhere along the lines, but AI being one of the main techniques that are used to analyze big data. And so this is uh, this, you know, what firms have reported in the survey. So for the, the users of big data, how they use big data. Some of them uh, you know, replied that they use it to expand their businesses, others to automate, so going back to Luca, others to upgrade or maybe the quality uh, channel that uh, they are proposing. So I think. You know, trying to connect back these different uses to what people have been discussing, I think you know, it's fair to say that we can think perhaps about maybe these three different uh, uses of big data. One big use of big data that seems to be true uh, you know, uh, in the data is that you know, a big part of it is, might be used for marketing and advertising. Huh? So perhaps the firms that have responded, that they expand uh, their businesses. Huh? So perhaps you know, a good example is the targeted adver advertising through social media. Uh, and so perhaps this, we can think about big data as improving matching between people. This is something that is 
that they touch about a little bit in the paper as a possibility, but I think indeed is an interesting uh, you know, avenue for research. And I think about a model of search frictions with imperfect information. You have more data, perhaps you obtain a better matching between firms and its customers. Perhaps this could be done in a model of product awareness, as in Jesse Perla's John Market paper on models of advertising. Another one is about you know, improving the production process. So thinking about firms are just producing one good. It's, it, you know, it's still the same good, but just, you're just going to become more productive at doing that. Huh? So for instance, uh, you know, delivery firms using geolocalizations for their drivers to optimize the delivery process. Huh? So this is probably something that we want to model as you know, a big data as R&D, something that leads to innovation and a growth effect in TFP. And finally, I think, you know, as we see in this uh, survey, 80% of the firms mentioned the quality. Uh, so, of course, the, the answers are a bit loose, but that might be exactly along the lines that I think uh, Laura and Mariam are trying to go. The idea that there is some customer taste that is volatile, that firms are trying to track, and that, you know, they're really using a lot of this data to uh, offer the best product to fit uh, this taste. And, you know, here I have a quote from Netflix and uh, the Cheesecake Factory. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, that firms are doing that actively, and this is what this paper uh, is about. So, overall, what we see is that the adoption of big data is large. Uh, seems to affect businesses importantly, but the phenomenon is quite varied uh, and probably could be modeled in different ways. And I think it's important to think about these different ways because the welfare impact, and if you want to think about regulation, is going to depend a lot on this. Uh, another, uh, another thing is that not all data is necessarily linked to past transactions. We saw that there are many different sources, social media, connected objects, etc. So perhaps the, the, the feedback that, uh, from data that is put in the model is, you know, might be weaker in practice. So. <clears throat> In the end, so I think whenever we talk about the big data, I think it's very easy to be quite loose uh, about big data. It's a you know, very abstract thing uh, and uh, you know, it's hard to measure. I think a strength of this paper is that it does not do that. It embraces a very particular way that you know, what data can do. It is about forecasting. Now, I think the paper still is a bit loose on the product uh, market side because in the end, the model tries to capture this idea of quality, but the quality is never fully measured. We have perfect competition. Uh, everything is loaded on the TFP uh, function, this function G, and it would be nice to know what is G. You know, where is it coming from? How do you discipline it empirically? Or perhaps use micro foundations to do that. Huh? Uh, I don't have much time, uh, perhaps I'll yeah, have some nerdy comments in the end, but maybe, uh, you know, I see I'm out of time. So I'll keep it for Mariam. In the end, just great paper. I think it's a you know, very inspiring paper to lay the, the grounds for the debate. Uh, it's already one of the you know, super cited paper that has opened the entire agenda. Of course, when we see the paper, we want to introduce more forces, and I'm listing here some of, some of those forces. And, you know, thanks a lot, Mariam, for the paper. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, why I don't give you the, the floor back for uh, in case you have uh, uh, some I feedback. just want to say thanks so much <laughs> for the very kind <laughs> comment and I cannot agree more with all the stuff that you said in particular the fact that there is a lot of lack of data about data I in fact uh, with two colleagues we have fought very hard to finally buy a data set about Digital, about the uh, supply chain of digital services from a startup in uh, California. So hopefully we can talk about these three classifications. We in fact ask them to specifically classify their technologies that they're uh, in these like advertisement, quality improvement, blah, blah. So you're like, at least you're exactly on, I, I don't know how he did it because I, didn't, I haven't told him about it. The only part that I think I would probably, my way of thinking is slightly different from you, is this notion of data is a byproduct of economic transactions. Let's, let me mm, just mention what you said about like the geolocalization in like Uber or transportation. That is, in, I mean, I would call that economic transaction because if somebody would not order an Uber, a driver would not go there. But that's the way that I think about. So probably you're right that, I mean, we have to be more precise about what I'm including in economic transactions. But, uh, but, but that's, that's, I guess, that's the only thing that I would say. Uh, the language that I'm using is different from the one that I, but everything else I'm like 100% <laughs> on board. Bartosz. Uh, 
Um, so I think it's a great paper, and I agree with the discussion that it's very inspiring. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, about the following. So I think it would be um, it would be great in the future to have a version with imperfect competition. So I I, I really like this idea of thinking as data. Um, as used for forecasting and is being gathered as part of economic activity. Uh, but then if I think of a firm that's gathering data as part of its own uh, economic activity, it's probably going to give this firm some informational uh, advantage over the others. It'll make it possible for the firm to charge a markup. Uh, and then uh, if I think about the mark how the market for information would work, uh, then it would actually be it. So you, you, at some point you said, you know, if if we think about physical capital, then either I have it or you have it. Well, with data, you can you could sell your data to me, and then we both have it, right? So actually, your iota might be zero, but what I gain by buying your data is I may be uh, gaining the ability to steal some of your customers. I'm forecasting better myself now. So maybe I'll end up reducing your markup. And I don't know actually, so this extension about um, with business uh, stealing maybe going some way toward this, maybe you could say a few more words about that. Um, okay, so I think what you raised is like actually great. So in fact, I would like to think about IOTA exactly as you mentioned. It might be that I can give you all of, sell you all of my data, but it's less useful or less profitable for me because you're capturing some of my information advantage. I'm 100% with you that the next step would be to incorporate imperfect competition. I mean, and that's actually not even the only margin. The margin of entry is very important in digital markets because um, when you think about digital platforms, one of their points of selling is that we're providing a platform for new entrants to actually use computing power and big data using the fixed cost of somebody else like AWS or Microsoft Azure. So in a sense, these are incumbents that are making money out of the new entrants. Okay, so they might not have the right incentives to share their, the best possible data with them. Okay, so, and that's, that's a slightly different mar margin, but again, imperfect competition. The, in particular, the business stealing, because we don't have that notion of information advantage, in fact, goes in some sense to the other direction in the sense that as a firm, when I sell my data because everybody else is small, I don't take into, I, I don't incorporate the fact that my data is being used against me. Okay, in that I'm basically, I have to be better than them, but that helps them. So I oversell my data in a sense. And the planner, a social planner would like to uh, a little bit attenuate the, the activity in the, that data market. Okay, that goes the other direction. But, uh, but that, what you mentioned is really, really important. Um, yeah, very nice paper. Uh, I was wondering a bit about the, like the interaction with um, R&D and discoveries of new products or, or technologies, but that there might not sort of be a trade-off here that firms may like. Think also about Sean's talk yesterday about uh, platforms, and maybe you put more investment into sort of milking that data rather than inventing goods. Uh, so would there be sort of a, a longer run trade-off there? So that is an extremely good point. So one thing that you can think about in this framework, and there are other papers who think about this in other frameworks, is that, okay, data can be used for, the, for, for a level shift in, uh, in uh, quality, the key part of the paper, and there is downward return, in, return to scale. At some points, firms are better off actually doing a jump, a ladder, but they might, but if that's caught, that kind of investment is costly, they might go too long for milking the data, as you mentioned. So that's a trade-off that uh, would be amazing to uh, think about. We have not thought about the, the ability of the firm to switch between these different two types, but that's a great idea. Luke? Thanks. Um, yeah, I wanted to push you on uh, regulation of data markets. I mean, to the extent... You can do that with the model that you have, because most of it is 
<coughs> things are efficient, right? But so in this extension with data stealing that Bartosz also asked about, how would you like us to think about regulation? Regulation of what? Because First, I was thinking maybe the depreciation schedule. We could just have uh, different accounting rules or whatever. But then you also highlighted the fact that most of these economic transactions are not even incorporated in the way we measure output. So could you help me a little bit to think about what we would regulate? OK, so let me say two things. One of them is, unfortunately, we took it out of this paper because the paper was like too large is that this notion of like negative bid ask spreads that I mentioned makes the, even if you start with perfectly identical firms, in the steady state, the data market would not die because firms would like to trade, okay? And then depending, and then this model is too simple, but if there is the other business stealing, if you want, like force, then there is too much trade and firms become too dispersed from each other while, um, in, in terms of the regulation, there is, um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not aware of what's happening in Europe, but in the US, there is this kind of newer industry called uh, data brokers. What they do is that they basically collect either other firms' information, like the firm that we bought their data from, or they uh, collect customer information and they sell it to other firms or competitors of the original firms and want to know what their competitors are doing or sell it to firms who want to advertise to these customers, okay. And um, for instance, in California and I think Vermont, these data brokers have to at least subscribe to a list so that people know this. So this notion of at least, I don't know, some providing some broad knowledge that you have to at least say that you are this or maybe trying to tax them in some shape or form because there are these data, they sell these data packages and like I've called like 40 of them and they're, I was like, can I get like anonymized quantity price of your transactions and they're like, no way because that's their business model and because that's so unknown, I have to ask you as a key regulator, how do you think it's possible to get access to the data of these guys? I don't, I don't see further questions from the floor, uh, but there is one here. Uh, in, the, in the linear normal framework, more information reduces variance. Could trading on it introduce noise to counter decreasing returns to scale in forecasting? Uh, so um, there are different ways of decreasing returns to scale to forecasting. One is what Edward mentioned, which is when the equilibrium, when the uh, distribution of the noise is fat tail, of, the, of what you learn, learn about is fat tail. Well, that's one way. The other way, which is slight in some sense simpler, but it's, it has its own difficulties, is if the variance of the noise of the AR1, which is the variance of innovation, is increasing over time, then uh, the effect of downward return to scale kind of falls because you're, inform because you're discounting the same information more. Okay, and uh, so that becomes uh, then more and more info when basically the point of this variance is that your prior information gives you a lot of information so the new data is less useful. If you discount that more, then new information mm -hmm. is more useful. So the de decreasing return kind of uh, dies down. That's a very good point. And that is, again, as everybody mentioned, is very context dependent. In some markets, that's the most relevant one. In some markets, it's less relevant. So this brings us exactly at the end, uh, to the end of the, the session. Great paper, very good discussion. Thank you. And great session in general. So many thanks. There is a coffee break now, a uh, hard commitment to, to come back at uh, 11.45, I believe. Thank you. <laughs>